Good afternoon. Um, hello and welcome to the Office of Professional Services and Human Capital Categories Industry Information and Outreach webinar series. My name is Arlinda Halliburton and I will be hosting today's session. These industry-focused webinars are designed to answer your questions about professional services acquisitions and to provide information to help you enhance business opportunities and successfully manage your GSA schedules contract. Today, our guest presenter is Mr. Sean Hartman. Sean is a customer service director for the Federal Acquisition Service and currently he serves um, as the CSD, Customer Service Director, for Patrick Air Force Base in Florida. He supports development and release of RFIs and RFQs on behalf of the government. And today is gonna share with us how the government buys and how, your how the government buys and how your company can best position itself to be a recipient of a government contract by sharing tips and best practices. Sean also has 12 years of active duty in the US Air Force and also does market research and mar market research functions for the government. Sean, take it away. Thanks so much, Arlinda. Hi, everybody. My name is Sean Hartman. Um, I am in Space Coast, Florida. Um, I should be able to share my screen with you here. And uh, we're going to hammer through. Uh, I'm not sure who was on a presentation uh, that I conducted last year. Uh, I did this same slideshow. Um, however, there's there's some additional um assistance that I'm going to, I'm going to dig into a little bit on this. So if you were in the presentation last year, uh, just hang with me and this will be a little bit of a refresher. And then we're going to jump into some live action. Um, everybody wants to know, you know, how does the government buy things, right? And uh, many of your companies have business development functions uh, in which you hired somebody who previously worked in contracting or acquisitions uh, and for them, this might be a, a, a good eye opener uh, or a refresher as well, um, or it just might be information that they already know. Uh, but either way, this is a good way to um, connect and kind of give you a, a background and a, a look into what my customers are typically doing here in the Space Coast for 45th Space Wing and also uh, NASA Kennedy Space Center, um, as well as Air Force Technical Application Center are my three main customers that I support. Um, I do have an office on the 45th uh, contracting office floor at Patrick Air Force Base. Uh, obviously I can't go there now because of COVID, we're uh, still teleworking, um, but I do frequently communicate uh, with the contracting offices and, uh, and want to help push things towards GSA solutions. Uh, we do frequent market research uh, in which when we identify open market uh, sources sought or pre-solicitation, or uh, we, we pass a contracting officer in the hall or on a phone call and, and ask about upcoming expiring contracts um, that we do have a GSA solution for. We try to give them uh, opportunity to solicit or at least do an RFI um, to our vendors to check the pools um, to make sure that we have quality uh, contractors who can perform the work. So uh, that being said, we're going to hammer through this slideshow. I'm going to go a little bit quick um, so that I can get to the live demo stuff because I feel like that's the most um, advantageous to you guys and value add for attending this training. And then uh, we'll obviously, if you have any uh, questions during the call, you can jump into that as uh, in the Q&A um, and I'll, I'll try to answer them as they come and, uh, and then we'll get on to it. So uh, like you, let me, oh, here we go. Okay. So, uh, some of the things you need to know, right? Office, uh, mo many of you guys are, are small business, uh, and, and maybe even new, uh, to, to this pool, uh, GSA helps support small businesses through our office of small business utilization. Uh, we'll talk, touch on that real quick. Uh, the importance of market research, uh, from your guys' perspective, because you want to know um, who your, your competitors are, right? Uh, we'll show you a little bit of how to do that. 
uh, tools to conduct market research, all the tools that are available to you guys and to our customers who are actually spending the money. And then key components for your strategy. You guys have most of those in place, so I'm going to skip through that. And then advantage of being a GSA contract holder, I'll show you guys uh, the back end of uh, Air Force or, or GSA Advantage. And also we're going to jump into GSA eBuy and I'll show you how uh, hypothetically I would, if I was a customer at Patrick Air Force Base who was going to post an RFI looking for sources um, for a service, an engineering service, right? Because most of you guys are in that uh, that area. So uh, tips for success, obviously we'll, we'll cover some of that. So uh, this is just the GSA overview. We do have the Federal Acquisition Service. We also have a public building service. Um, and we're technically the federal procurement arm of the United States government. So that's why GSA is becoming a forefront of spending. If you guys aren't familiar with spend under management, uh, M-19-13 was a memo put out by Office of Management and Budget uh, that a lot of agencies are starting to follow. Go ahead and Google that and save it and, and get to know it really well because it'll help you sell your, your schedule and your solution to those customers uh, when you're trying to win work. Uh, it also helps to be part of a best-in-class contract like Oasis um, or one of our other IT services contracts. The Office of Small Business uh, Utilization Overview uh, basically falls in line with public law 95507. I'm not going to dig too much into this, but but really at the end of the day, we're looking out for small businesses a lot. It doesn't mean that our, our large or, or other uh, vendors don't win work. They do very, very frequently, but um, we do help our customers meet their small business goals uh, through uh, practicable uh, usage, usage of GSA solutions. Here's where all of our regions are located. I'm in the region four Southeast region, also known as the best region um, for GSA. We love it down here. And, and uh, we, have, we have tons of awesome customers. Um, and for you guys, they're spending a lot of money. Uh, we have, we have uh, you know, big centers of excellence for NASA. We have a uh, big Air Force spend. Um, we also have uh, SOCOM and, and SOUTHCOM. Um, and also JSOC is located in region four, uh, big spenders and, and really, uh, you know, Redstone Arsenal and, and things of that nature. So, so region four is a, a huge epicenter for GSA um, targets of opportunity. So um, every other region has their own uh, headquarters, uh, but we're in region four. So my boss sits in Atlanta and I'm down here at Patrick Air Force Base. All right, so you wanna develop leads, right? So you have to know what agencies are buying, how much they're buying, which ones are set asides, what are expiring contracts, who your competitors are, who holds the current contract that's going to expire, and can you set up a team and arrangement to help win the recompete, right? There's, there's some things you can do to set yourself apart um, and really get ahead in your BD um, for identifying these opportunities, right? So you want to compete in the future. If you're looking for stuff right now, right now, you're probably already six, nine, 12 months late. So you want to make sure that you get ahead of the unknown. All right. Let the data refine your search uh, and overall strategy. Um, there's agency forecast tools. Get, start getting efficient in GSA eLibrary. Get efficient in um, the... Uh, some of the tools that I'm going to cover here uh, for, for data queries and uh, spend from an agency perspective. And that way you can choose the right events, you know, when we start going back to those events. And you can also choose the right agencies to target that are applicable to your service or and or products if you sell some. Um, you're going to conduct market research, identify your targets. I, obviously, I talked about this, and this is really your business development plan, right? You want to make sure you're, you're generating leads and working those leads from start to finish. FPDS is huge. If you don't have an FPDS NG account, um, I highly recommend you go to fpds.gov. All federal agencies are, are required to report on anything over the, the $3,500 threshold um, as specified in FAR Part 
4.6. Basically what that does is that lets you look at uh, contracts that are, are awarded, what the length of the contract is, how much dollars have been obligated to that contract, um, you know, and forecast your opportunities out, right? So, you know, many people use GovWin or GovTribe. And to be honest, I use GovTribe all the time for myself to try to identify expiring opportunities. But FPDS um, typically will have what you need to know. Uh, and you can also export the data uh, into your, your uh data sources like Tableau or Excel and, and be able to filter and, and work through it. So um, it's, a, it's a really good tool. Make sure that you're using it. Uh, obviously, you want to focus on your NAICS, right? So if you don't have your NAICS self-registered in SAM, you want to make sure that you are identifying what capabilities you have from the North American Industry Classification System and get those in SAM.gov and make sure that you're, you're self-certifying. Um, and then also narrow it down to the PSCs, right? Because these are the ways that the customer is searching for you. They, they typically identify their NAICS category and in many of your circumstances uh, for government purchasing and engineering services would be 541 330, uh, if you don't have that NAICS, then you're not going to be found, right? Uh, and then within that NAICS, there's also PSCs that are a little bit uh, more, more drilled down, right? And, and also they use it for size standard and things of that nature to make sure that they're awarded to the appropriate size business. Um, again, FPDS is, is super important. And like I said, you can run some ad hoc reports in FPDS um, under the training and report manual. Um, and then also here's a phone number for the help desk if you want uh, some information. Okay, so GS, like I said, there's some tools to conduct market research. GSA eLibrary, the Schedule Sales Query Plus, uh, that's a D2D, right? Data to Decisions. It's run by gsa.gov and it uses all previously um, executed federal acquisition service contracts that were awarded and, and basically lets you know where the government is spending money, right? So if you want, you, one of your main NAICS codes, um, you know, is, is a uh, NAICS in the schedule sales query that you search and the government spends very minimal amount of dollars, then you know that your probability of winning is, is diminished, right? So you wanna make sure that you have as many of the categories, the SIN categories within GSA on your schedule as applicable. So if you, basically what I, what I tell people and, and the contracting offices sometimes look at this in a different perspective uh, when, when they're doing modifications to your GSA contract, but if you have a NAICS in SAM, you should also have that SIN, that applicable SIN using the GSA multiple award schedule crosswalk for those NAICS. You can find that on GSA eLibrary. Um, if you click on the link and go to the right-hand side, um, there will be, um, there will be uh, a, a link on the right-hand side. It says multiple award schedule uh, crosswalk. For, for many of you who are in the Oasis um, vehicle, uh, your NAICS are identified under your pools, right? So pool one will have specific NAICS that are applicable. Uh, pool two, three, four, five, A, five, B, and so on and so forth. So you want to identify in GSAE library, I'll show you where you can see which NAICS are in which pools so that you can say, oh man, maybe we do have another NAICS that we can apply uh, to an alternate pool in, in the future. So uh, it's really just one of those things you want to want to check. And then there's also USAspending.gov. Um, it's a repository of all government transactions um, over 3,500. It's it's more than just GSA. So schedule sales query is just GSA federal acquisition sales, and FPDS.gov USA spending is is all to include open market. So these are just some tools to help you narrow down where you want to have your um, uh, your business vector towards. Um, here's how you access the forecasting tool. Um, this is from the GSA uh, acquisition gateway. 
All right. So acquisition gateway is another cool, cool tool and you would be non-federal government and public users. So you want to register with the acquisition gateway. Um, and then once you get there, you click on tools and you can click forecast of contract and opportunities. Um, we have our agency heads that we have direct communication with through our national account managers and our categories directors. And we, we get forecasts um, in advance for what the agencies are trying to spend. So we, we have another tool here. It's hallways.cap.gsa.gov. So check that out. Obviously, you want to market your GSA schedule in every direction, right? Um, with that being said, you, you have to have a long and short-term strategy. Like I said, if you're looking right now to win work that's posted right now, you're already behind the schedule. Um, obviously, you want to follow the regulatory restrictions as far as what you're, you're looking to bid on. Um, I am going to touch a little bit on the Brooks Act today. Um, I'm not a legal professional, so disclaimer, I only know what I read on the internet. So uh, there's some regulatory restrictions associated with engineering, um, uh, architectural and engineering services that, that are associated with GSA and the Brooks Act. So I'm going to touch on that a little bit. Um, but obviously, you want to have your target markets, right? Uh, and do a market assessment. What's the advantage of using GSA, right? Is faster than going open market. So these are some of the things that you can sell to the customers when you get contact with the contracting officers on any project, right? So, you know, there were some people on the Oasis uh, from the last call I did, uh, and they had just recently won a really cool contract that I helped uh, NASA work on for engineering support services. When they win that contract, now they have a direct communication with that contracting officer and they can say, hey, do you have anything else that you're working on um, that might be in this category or any of your coworkers that they were thinking about going open market? We can do that on GSA and we can do it faster, right? So you want to help sell your contract. That's, this is how I go into the the meetings and I say, hey, you know what? We have pre-negotiated ceiling prices Then make sure we get the best value on, on labor categories, right? Um, everything's built within FAR compliance. So you don't have to check and double check and triple check and, and do the research to find out if it's compliant because we've already done that. Um, obviously the socioeconomic goals, I'll show you a little bit on a, a cool tool we have called MRAS. Maybe some of you have participated in market research as a service surveys. I'll show you what the survey looks like when we get it and how we present it to our customer. Uh, and then obviously access to emerging technologies. I, I was talking a little bit earlier about the new AI and cyber and, and, thing, and cloud computing and things of that nature. GSA is on the forefront of these innovative solutions. So that's, that's how we sell this to our customers and we, we help them realize that GSA is a solution and it's not just for buying paper clips and, and pencils. And they can really procure some big dollar uh, services associated with GSA schedules. Um, here's another small business scorecard uh, link, uh, smallbusinessdata.gov. Um, it's just really to see how you stack up. You want to check that and, and make sure that you're um, you're falling in the right categories and, and, and where people are spending the money from a government-wide overall spend. Um, obviously, agency profile. Every agency should have a different profile. I know the key players at Kennedy Space Center. I know their budgets. I know their upcoming opportunities. I know what the competition is, NASA Soup or Open Market or some of their internal IDIQ processes. I know what the competition is, so you guys should as well. Do the research, get invested, and really drill it down so when you present your solution, your GSA solution, you're able to overcome those, those objections and their, their drawbacks initially up front, knowing that they're already thinking about another, oppor another uh, procurement opportunity. Um, okay, CSDs. This is me, right? This is what we do. And, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about myself uh, here in the future. So don't worry about that slide. All right. So tips for success. Respond to RFIs. I couldn't foot stomp this any more than I am right now. If you don't respond to the sources sought, the customers think that GSA vendors are not 
a solution. And if they think you're not a solution on one single RFI, then they will think you're not a solution on any RFIs in the future. You completely eliminate your capability of bidding on future GSA work because they won't consider GSA at all if they don't get good responses on sources sought. In the last year, I've seen a significant uptick in, in engineering support services uh, responses on both OASIS and in our multiple award schedules. And I thank you guys so much. I'm, I'm hoping that there's other people out there preaching the same message uh, and, it, and it looks like it's working. Uh, when I first started as a CSD, I had two back-to-back -back RFIs that were big dollar support services requirements and there was zero response. And now those, those customers on that on those projects will never come to me again for anything because they think our vendors can't do it. So always respond to RFIs and sources sought, even if it's to say, we don't have the bandwidth to do this right now. That's fine. It gives the feedback and it lets us know what the, the current climate is out there for our vendors. Um, attend industry days, those are super important. Um, uh, that's where you can really ask the questions and you can put face to face with the customers um, and strategically manage your time at matchmaking events. This is huge. I have done some stuff for NASA in which I spoke to people who had no previous understanding of what GSA was and they had 100,000 questions at the event only to come to find out that they wouldn't be eligible to get a GSA schedule at all because they didn't have two years of experience um, in that industry, right? Or they didn't have uh, uh, appropriate socioeconomic status selected or they you know, weren't a US citizen or, or whatever the case may be. You wanna make sure that you are talking to the customers that are applicable to the work that you perform. Um, obviously, network with other GSA contractors. I can't tell you enough how important it is to establish those relationships with people who do services that complement what you do and or same services, because sometimes your bandwidth might not be able to pull off the entire breadth or scope of the work. But if you have you and somebody else, you can pull it off easily and you want to be prepared for those RFQs with ahead of time teaming arrangements and things of that nature uh, and or subcontractor agreements. Um, check GSA eBuy for opportunities regularly. If you don't have a BD person who is in GSA eBuy as the point of contact and or set up notifications to receive when things are posted in GSA eBuy, then you need to get one immediately and they need to check it. Because when we get something and we, we tell a customer, hey, we'll help you po post an RFI and that RFI only goes to the category we select. If it's Oasis Pool 1, it'll only go to Oasis Pool 1 contractors. Well, that we need to know Oasis Pool 1 contractors are reviewing those RFIs and responding. So I really appreciate that you guys are doing that. Uh, if you don't have that in already set up, make sure you get it set up. Uh, federal supply schedule price list, right? So obviously you want to keep it simple and short, right? So don't um, don't have it over elaborated. Very simple um, labor categories. Very simple uh, pricing, right? With with your built-in escalations and and things of that nature. You want to make sure it's it's easy to read for the customers, so they don't have to really really search too deep to try to find a crosswalk. Um, Price list can be distrib distributed and custom mailing list provided to your contracting officers. If you want to, um, sometimes they'll accept emails if you just want to send it to them like, hey, I, I noticed next year you're going to be soliciting or, or that this contract's going to expire. I think we can do the work. Check out our price list, um, you know, to help you with your independent government cost estimate, right? You want to get your name out there uh, and try to attack those things prior to the customers being in the market. Um, and obviously that goes the same with your brochure and other literature. Um, okay, so your ECAT. Um, I don't know if a lot of you guys have uh, commodities or not. I understand submitting your ECAT can take a significant 
um, amount of time. Um, but these are things that are, that are, you know, specifically towards commodities. Um, I don't, I don't think you guys have to worry about this. Um, but for, uh, Oasis contractors, uh, your, your ECAT uploads probably not going to take that, that long of a time. Cause a lot of, of your stuff is standardized. Um, you know, so in addition to that federal supply schedule price list, this only applies to schedule pricing, not necessarily your Oasis pricing, because um, we know that that's not predetermined up front. So uh, this is if you have your a GSA schedule as well, um, make sure that you're, you're marketing that separate from your Oasis schedule. All right, uh, make your website GSA friendly. The easier it is for a customer to find your, your capabilities, the easier it is for them to, to use you in their market research. Use our GSA logos. Um, you can go to gsa.gov and there's a GSA logo download, add it um, to your, your website. Uh, here's some additional solutions, Small Business Administration, Minority Business Development Agency, APTAC, um, you know, really just go to gsa.gov small business and or dot slash events and you can uh, find a ton of, of opportunity where we partner with these agencies. Um, this is all, oh man, I burned through that. Okay, so this is uh, really a little bit more on that small business uh, office. And then also I have Jan Ziegler, she's our industry liaison for, for Region 4 and, and Chastity Ash is the Region 4 small business, office small business utilization point of contact. You can also contact them anytime. I lean on them pretty frequently. Um, and I, maybe Jan's on this call. Uh, I invited her as well uh, in case she wanted to add anything. So um, I'm going to jump out of this slideshow uh, and get into some other stuff. Before I do that, I want to check to see that there's any questions. Um, yes, recording will be available, I believe. Um, web link uh, oh, the spend. Somebody had a question about the spend web link. That's going to be your schedule sales query plus the D2D. And again, this is going to be in the slides that you receive. And then also usaspending.gov. Um, how does the transition of federal websites to beta.sam, soon to be just SAM, affect FPDS? Will award data... Uh, that's a great question. So they are working to have um, beta.sam eventually communicate with FPDS. Um, I'm not a web guy, so I can't really speak to the connection on the back end, but that's what it's eventually going to go to. Um, and it, what's really cool and what I tell customers is beta.sam is a GSA website, right? So we own that website we are using all of the data to be able to more effectively formulate uh, pre-competed GSA contract vehicles uh, for customers to be able to use on a quick, um, quick use and save money. So if, if you haven't noticed, things are shifting heavily towards um, best in class and spend under management solutions. Um, wasn't FPDS retired and migrated? Well, oh, so similar question. At, at FPDS is still real. Um, it is migrating under beta.sam. Um, and yes, that is another question. Uh, and, and you should, if not already, be able to search beta.sam for FPDS data. Um, I don't know about the ad hoc reporting. I'm sure that they're, they're working that in the development. Um, but if they don't have it already, uh, it, it'll, it'll likely be soon. Um, lots of questions on FPDS. Uh, okay, so somebody asked, increasingly we're seeing Oasis small business RFIs for very large 900 million to billion uh, sent out subsequently procured unrestricted. I know at least 25 Small businesses reply and fed sim opportunity. This is very costly to small businesses. Why would small businesses continue uh, to expend precious money on chasing windmills? Okay, great question. So um, I'm not a fed sim 
person. Uh, that's a different area within GSA. Um, we, I strictly operate on uh, uh, federal acquisition service side of customer and stakeholder engagement using multiple word schedules. That's my area. So I can't really speak on FedSim, but I can tell you this. When I approach a customer and they have a requirement, I recommend that they do the RFI to both small business and unrestricted, unless they've been told by the small business office that they have to go small business. In that case, then they don't even put the RFI out to unrestricted. The variable that I believe you're seeing is they, we, the customers cannot get an approval to purchase unless they've checked the small business pools and determined whether or not, even if in 25 small businesses responded, um, those 25 responses will then go to the tech reviewers for that customer and the tech reviewers come back and say, yeah, these people can do this work or, or we prefer these people, right? And if there's not enough qualified competition within the small businesses to perform the breadth of the work that they believe, then they'll, they may go to um, unrestricted. So I can't really speak to each customer's you know, mindset in that um, or the circumstance, but I, I have seen in the past where uh, small businesses have replied and it, it ends up not being something that the tech reviewers believe the small businesses can do based on their responses. Um, I have seen it where unrestricted vendors re, uh, replied and then the small business office said, hey, these three small businesses can do it. Even though you had six unrestricted, I need you to, to do a small business set aside. And then it went small business and they won. So um, you know, it, it, it worked out pretty good for them. So I, I can't, obviously your, your, I understand your money and, and the, the idea of the big work. Um, it, it's really just going to have to be a, a determining factor on your end on whether or not you want to make it happen or, or, or pass on the opportunity. Um, I hope I answered that. I'm sorry if I didn't clarify as, as much as possible, but you can email me and we can link up later. Um, somebody said they're confused about difference between GSA and OASIS. GSA is the overarching um, body of, uh, as an agency and OASIS is um, a solution. It's a best in class solution, pre-competed contract within GSA. Um, looks like there's a bunch more questions. I'm going to try to get to, to more questions here in a little bit, um, but I, I'm going to, I want to jump into this back end stuff so you guys can see what a customer looks like. Cause I think I'm at my halfway point. Um, so if I didn't get to your question, I know John DeWolf is, uh, is going to be looking at some of the questions and he might be able to answer those, um, from his perspective as well. Um, okay. So I'm jumping on GSAE library. So Hypothetically, let's pretend um, on, the, on the lowest level possible, I work as a program manager um, for, uh, I'm a lieutenant at a 45th civil engineering squadron, and we need uh, to do some sort of engineering uh, work on a remodel. I might come in here and I might say, okay, cool. Well, I, I think it's it's engineering professional services, right? So, so I might click professional services first. Um, uh, I might go to technical and engineering services. And then I get here and I'm like, ooh, 541330 ENG, engineering service. That kind of sounds like what I'm looking for. And then you can get even further into the subgroups, right? Like may, say maybe it's fire protection engineering services um, or civil engineering, whatever the case may be. I could click on that or I could just go straight here to 541330ENG. And when I click this, it's going to, to bring up for me the entire list of 931 contractors who have this category. Within that, I can filter it down. Say I only want to go with 8A. 
I can click 8A and go, and it filters it down to 73, or say I wanted to go SDVOSV, I can filter that down and there's only 13. Um, I can go to women owned, right? So, so we can really filter it down significant, or we can say all socioeconomic indicators. And then within that, we can, we can search for maybe a company we know about or not. Uh, the cool part is for the government customer is they can quickly click on contractors terms and conditions and determine whether or not those vendors can perform the work that they're looking for right. Um, so this is a really cool website to kind of figure that out if they wanted to go straight from here and they're like yep this is the category they can click get quotes. And it'll jump them straight into GSA e buy and I should be logged in so it'll, it should pull me in. Um, cool. So it, it pulls me to GSA eBuy. Um, it, I guess it logged me out. Let me jump back in here real quick. All right. So I'm in uh, GSA eBuy and I want to uh, do some basic market research to find out which vendors could perform um, the work that I'm looking for, because once I figure out the three vendors, if, if you guys don't know this, um, a customer on a base typically will have to submit a independent government cost estimate, their statement of work or PWS, and a form nine to their contracting office, right? That form nine <clears throat> looks something like this. So it's a request for purchase. And, and obviously this one just has bottled water. And, and it's funny because Air Force can't buy bottled water um, through GSA. It's, it's one of those things. Anyway, so um, they will basically fill out this information here. They'll put the description and then they might list within this, this form the names of the vendors that perform the work, right? This is their general independent government cost estimate and request for purchase. This is how they're asking for the funds. So you want to be on this form nine when they submit it to contracting to ask for the funds. So typically they will come here <clears throat> and they'll click prepare a new RFQ. They'll, if they put in, actually, let me jump back here real quick to, oh, it's not going to take me back. Uh, we'll go 541-330-ENG. And it's going to take me here. I click select. When I get into GSA eBuy um, and I have the item selected, I can then, of course, break it down in a socioeconomic category. I can click select all, or if I don't want to select all, I can click only the vendors that I want this notification to go to. And, and based on FAR Part 8.4, I don't need uh, to select all of them. I can. I can do it uh, as long as there's enough to believe that I will reasonably get enough competition. If for your guys' case, um, Oasis, say I just wanted to go with pool, I've already identified 541330 ENG is part of Oasis Pool 1. I might put two separate solicitations out for Pool 1 unrestricted and Pool 1 small bit, maybe three for and not solicitations, excuse me, sources sought um, because I'm the, I'm the end user, I'm the buying agency. So I might click Oasis Small, Small Business Pool 1 and then I acknowledge that I've done the DPA training and I understand how to solicit. And within this, see, it doesn't let me select just one vendors because in Oasis, it has to be competed against all the this, uh, holders of that that requirement. So I'm going to post it in Oasis Small Business Pool 1. I can click continue and then I can build my RFI. And this is where it assigns the RFQ number. So obviously everything will still have an RFQ number. In order for me to change the, the label of this requirement to an RFI, I'll click this block right here. It says seeking sources or information only. When I do that, it's going to put this uh, RFQ being sent for market research. It's a disclaimer. Um, this is what the customer will click 
until they have obligated funding. They can't do an RFQ or they're not supposed to do a formal RFQ, RFP, um, unless they have approved funding already. Um, so typically the during the market research phase, they're gonna get seeking sources or information only. They're gonna put a cool little catchy RFQ title. They're gonna put the description, the date they want it to close on. Here's one thing you guys wanna recognize, and, and I had some people under, that didn't understand this before, is this automatically defaults to two calendar days. Sometimes customers, they won't change this because it defaults to two calendar days. So just because you see something that is only open for two days doesn't mean they already have a vendor selected. It just means the person posting this didn't change this date. So don't think that that things that are posted short period of time are already decided upon. That's that's old business. That's not how we do things anymore in the government or, or the preponderance of co contracting officers don't. Um, they can change this. Obviously, they can push it out, um, at, you know, as far as they need to. Um, one of the other things we recommend to customers do is not close on a Friday um, keep it open until Monday morning, give you guys time over the weekend if you want to submit, um, you know, and, and also try not to post on a, or close on a weekend. Um, so minimum two days, I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. It's a minimum of two days is what they're required to do. Five calendar days is what it defaults to. So a lot of times you'll see it open for five days is because the, the customers think, oh, it defaults to five days. That's all I need. Uh, people will respond. So Make sure you're responding, even if it is a short period of time. Uh, please select one of the following options. A lot of times this will be zero for an RFI. So don't think to yourself, if you see zero here, you're like, man, there's no way I can get um, four uh, mechanical engineers on site uh, within zero days of, of order. This is the RFI. They're not going to change that date because it's not a formal solicitation. Um, and then sometimes services, they'll come down here and, and they'll, you know, put the wrong period of performance. Just ask those questions when you're responding. Um, attach documents. They'll attach documents here, statement of work, uh, blueprints, schematics, measurements, pictures, could be anything. Always review the attached documents. Sometimes there will be line items where they can add a manufacturer part number that's specific um, and for a specific requirement. Uh, that obviously you want to review that as well. And then shipping address, right? The last customer I helped was was for the VA down in Miami, uh, or I'm sorry, they were in Miami, but it was, it was the contracting office was in Tampa. So don't always believe the address that's here is where the actual work is being performed. Make sure you ask the person um, in this individual re receiving shipment column um, who or where or, or when the work's going to be performed. Once they finish all of these items, this little check block here will be green for everything and they can save draft or submit whatever. Um, as Once it's saved as draft, it goes into my RFQs. I'm not going to save this because I have a ton. So it goes into my RFQs, right? And, uh, and then see, I've helped tons and tons of people, right? And there's some that have zero response, some have nine or 38 or whatever, right? So you have a, a bunch of uh, uh, responses in here. So if I clicked the RFQ, actually, let me go to, um, I think I had one already selected. Uh, hang on here real quick. Here we go. I'm, I'm going to pick something that you guys um, probably weren't involved in. It was completely different, right? So say it was uh, control tower window shades, right? Um, this went to these vendors here. Uh, this was actually a long time ago before we went into uh, our current multiple word schedule. But when you guys respond, it comes in like this, right? And all the quotes come in down here. It'll either be no quote if you select no quote, or it'll be the actual dollar value, or maybe it says zero in here, but um, you might have 
since this was an RFI, you didn't put a, a specific dollar amount because you're just submitting a capability statement. That's perfectly fine as well. Um, but really, this is what it looks like on the back end. And the contracting officer can or the customer can manage and see all the quotes in one spot or all the responses. They can print capability statements. If, you know, in this circumstance right here, this contractor submitted a price to a source of sought and didn't put any capability statement. This is read that this says seeking capable vendors, right? This is RFQ is seeking sources. Give your capability statement and really sell yourself as to how you can perform this work, right? Um, and, and this is what they look, uh, look like on, on the back end. Um, so hopefully you guys can see how something from a, a contracting officer perspective, when they get it on their end, what it looks like. Um, and then, of course, there will be, you know, these are all expired. This is from, you know, uh, last year, but there will be a button if you click RF, uh, the RFQ number and it takes you to the quote details, there will be a button down here that says award or not award. Uh, and then sometimes that's how it makes, it gives you the notification, but um, you obviously you put in your, your quote information and, and documentation here uh, and any sort of uh, discounts, right? You wanna make sure that you're putting in some discounts to try to uh, make the customer think that you're awesome. So that's eBuy on the back end. Um, hopefully you guys can see how that works. Now, another way for the customers to search for services is GSA Advantage. They can click this drop down here from products is the default and they can go to services or BPAs. Uh, they go to services and maybe they already know it's 541330ENG. It'll give all the contracting officers or, or uh, vendors uh, that have 541330ENG in and Basically, you can click view contractor information. It pulls up their GSA e-library window and then view contractor catalog. And the customer can quickly see all of your price list in three clicks. So uh, make sure that you are searchable within uh, GSA Advantage. Go ahead and search your, you know, any keywords that are applicable to your company and make sure that you're able to uh, be pulled up there. And, and again, this is this is specific to um, the catalog for the multiple award schedule. It's not necessarily specific towards um, Oasis. So um, let me see here. Uh, E-buy minimize. All right. So the Brooks Act, um, I'm sure you guys all know about it, right? So there are certain things obviously we can do in GSA, but there's other things we can't. So if the preponderance of the work is associated with architectural and engineering services and the customer needs you to physically stamp and sign your engineering products, then it can't be performed on a GSA schedule. And all the engineering services um, are up and to that point in time. Um, and then they have a uh, on-site engineer that reviews the plans and or products and does the final approval. So uh, you wanna familiarize yourself with the Brooks Act um, and determine whether or not before you contact a customer read their statement of work and the requirements and determine whether or not you're, you know, chasing a, a rabbit down a rabbit hole um, and, and whether or not you can do it on GSA contract or if it's going to be something that uh, is only done on the open market because of the Brooks Act limitations. So uh, familiarize yourself with that. And again, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't tell you how that operates. But I'm at, I'm, at, I'm at 51 minutes, so I'm going to jump onto these questions here real quick. Um, and pause on this. Let me pull this guy up here real quick. All right. Um, 
Okay, let me jump into some of these questions here. We had uh, Oasis going to Big Mac. Yeah, that's going to be happening um, soon or eventually. Uh, it's not like a, a near-term thing, but yeah, you're you're definitely ahead of that. Um, uh, but not applicable right now. Just stick, you know, Oasis is, is in its last... Uh, period of performance. So at the end of it, we want to make sure we have something um, that we can offer to customers. So we're, we're going to plan for a sunset um, response. In regards to responding to all RFIs, say only a couple reply when an agency is looking to see if uh, work for Oasis, will they move on if only a couple people respond? Um, okay, so yes, if only two people respond in an RFI, the customer could quickly say, all right, cool, um, this is not going to be a solution, and then they go a different route. They need at least three qualified responses. So for instance, I just had some work um, uh, for one of my customers, and 15 people responded to the RFI. Uh, and actually, I'll show you something that that's cool. Man, where did I put? The, here it is. Okay, so I talked about our market research as a service. So in addition to GSA eBuy, we also have this cool market research as a service survey. Um, so this one is for strategic management support services, not engineering. So hopefully, I'm I'm not conflicting with anybody who responded to this. But there's 55 people responded. To this RFI. The odds that this is going to be a set aside to a GSA solution is significantly high, right? Um, there's 53 that were on multiple award schedule and then 16 had another GSA contract, um, likely something in profession like Oasis, right? Or a BPA. Uh, the SIN was 541611. Um, and and they, the customer gets this report and it even shows socioeconomic breakdown, right? With how many women own, how many disabled veteran own, 8A. They might even have 55 respond, but they say, oh, cool, 15 veteran owned small businesses. Why don't we set it aside to this category? Because we've determined that 15 vendors in that category can do it. They use this to kind of drill down how low they can set it aside to meet their socioeconomic categories. If they only get two responses, they're they're not able to really narrow it down. So they they may move on. Um, so I hope that if if you see an MRAS survey come out on Oasis, respond. Uh, it's really cool. It gives like all your contact information, um, your contract, your socioeconomic breakdowns. Um, man, there's like a ton here. It gives your capability statement if you upload it. Um, any feedback, and then also the answers to the technical questions, right? So do you have in-depth knowledge, understanding of NASA? 45 said yes, 10 said no. One of the things to understand here is these questions are go, no, go. So anybody who answers no to any of these would likely not be considered in that market research uh, for capable vendors. So um, it is helpful though, because it shows like, hey, we, these are the areas that we need to find more vendors for, or this is what we need to do. And then it shows the answers to the everybody answered on the questions. And then additional feedback. We give you opportunity to type in additional feedback. It's super cool. Uh, and then GSA contracting officer gives a conclusion and recommend. The Air Force will receive adequate competition on their multiple award schedule. The Air Force may able to qualify for socioeconomic interests, right? So the contracting office can use this to speed up their acquisition. So I hope that answers your question and, and shows you that the MRAS process is a really cool way to also get in front of customers. Um, can MPA joint venture utilize the mentor and protege's past performance for getting on GSA multiple award schedule? I am not a contracting officer, so I, I can't answer that, Jennifer. Um, I would highly recommend whoever your GSA point of contract uh, point of contact is at your contracting office, um, shoot that question over to them and they'll let you know what the limitations are on that. Um, does the government search for contractors using NAICS and PSC or just by PSC? 
NAICS is really the, the main, it, main way to search. Uh, and then PSC is even lower. Um, I'll jump back on here to uh, GSA eLibrary and, uh, and show you where that uh, available offerings crosswalk is. So right here, MOS available offerings. If you click that, it'll give you a Excel document. Where is it downloading somewhere? Here it is. Um, and it'll give you an Excel document and it, it breaks down um, pretty much everything that is available, SIN, the NAICS, the PSC, the maximum dollar value for that uh, threshold, uh, size standard, whether it's state and local eligible or not, and then also a SIN description. So this document is, is really helpful for determining where you position yourself uh, within the capabilities um, that the government's looking for. Um, hope that answered your question. Uh, how do contractors become listed in the GSA library that was just displayed? Um, if you have a GSA schedule, you are in GSA e library. Go to GSA e library and search your vendor name, uh, your company name, and it should populate. Um, what criteria is generally used to determine if a vendor can perform a job? Uh, it, criteria is, uh, are vary, right? So criteria number one um, could be LPTA, right? Lowest price technically acceptable. Uh, criteria, they, they, if they use anything other than LPTA, they, they still don't, in GSA, they still don't have to give a, a formal debriefing um, or uh, explanation. They just have to give a general reason or basis of award um, to, to the people who didn't win. So it's it really kind of speeds things up. Uh, but they'll let you know, like, if it's past performance driven um, or if it's certification or license driven um, or if it's a lowest price technically acceptable circumstance or if it's applicable past experience. And NASA, a lot of times, will only hire vendors who have experience supporting NASA. Um, so that's why it's important to have subcontract agreements with people and, and find vendors who are already on um, and try to team up. So I hope that helps, Krishna. Uh, if we responded to an e-buy opportunity as no quote for a reason, uh, would that exclude future? No, it would not exclude you from future opportunities. Um, reply, no quote, anytime you want. Uh, if you want to put an explanation in there on why you didn't quote, that's usually helpful. Um, and sometimes it's, we don't have the current bandwidth because we're, we have competing priorities um, on other work that we already started working on. And that's fine. Um, would you suggest we ask for extensions on RFI? That's a great question. Yes, you can ask for an extension. No, they don't have to give it to you. So uh, it's definitely something that's important for you guys to be able to, you know, stretch it out. Uh, another cool thing to understand on the RFI process is if you email the contracting officer at the point of contact and you ask for an extension, they might say, yeah, just go ahead and send it to me by, for, you know, Monday next week or Tuesday or whatever it is. And they give you a couple extra days to email it to them. Even if you're not in the GSA e buy response, they can still consider you in their market research. So it's important to answer as, uh, or communicate as much as possible. Uh, where are archived RFP RFI documentation stored? Um, there is a GSA e -buy open. Um, you know, I don't know if you guys have access to that. You could probably Google it, um, but it's through Acquisition Gateway. Um, so if you go through GSA Acquisition Gateway, there should be a GSA e -buy open um, and it'll show you uh, all past uh, uh, RFIs, RFP, RFQs. Um, only the ones that were done through the e -buy system. Uh, should we respond in e -buy when the CO asks for email submittals? That's a great question. Uh, I think Jonathan's answering that. I would say absolutely. It, it's not hard to click a few buttons and upload what you sent in an email. Um, and it's good for historical 
um, reference from a, a backend perspective. Um, feedback for what it's worth, consider advising customers to minimize the RFI response length. Oh yeah, that's a great, um, Rob mentioned that, that you know, he's seen RFI responses, 10, 25 page um, responses for, you know, as little as, as three FTE. Um, a lot of times they'll, the, if it's too in depth, um, your capabilities lost on that. So, you know, definitely um, have an applicable RFI short, sweet, to the point response uh, that, that shows your capabilities. Um, I think I'm two minutes over. Uh, let me stop sharing here. Arlinda, can I keep going? And do people want to stay on? It looks like we got 150 people still on. Um. John, how are we doing? I know we are over time. Um, I can we go longer? This, uh, I think we allotted some extra time here. Yeah, you can if you want to. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep answering questions. Is am, am I doing okay? You're doing great. I think right. I mean, we can a lot have a lot of interest. So please keep going. And John, yeah, if you could just the... signal me when we have to shut it down. But yeah, right until on. then, I'm in. Cool. Um, okay, what is a reasonable amount of time to wait before following up with a contracting officer on updates to an RFI source of SOC? Um, so I'll tell you, it depends on the internal agency's timeline and processes. I can tell you this, I've done RFIs that were 12 to 14 or 16 months out from even being considered on an award. Um, and it's really just to test the water. So uh, there could be an RFI that, that's posted and they don't even post a formal RFQ for another six months. So I, I'd say, you know, definitely follow up a few weeks after. And, uh, and usually the contracting officers will respond and say like, hey, we were just doing market research. Uh, it's going to be a little while. Very rarely will a contracting officer commit to a timeline on when they're going to post uh, the RFQ because there's so many different variables in their acquisition planning process that slow things down. Um, so don't expect a, a, a specific time um, every, every time they ask or timeline. Um, hope that helped, Chad. Uh, all right, PCOs typically ask vendors to email RFI response in, in lieu of uploading eBuy. Um, I already answered this question. Yes, definitely upload it, even if you're emailing it anyway. Um, it, it's it, contracting officers can accept responses, however, they um, personally like to manage their responses. So uh, it's definitely good to have them in um, eBuy because then the contracting officer can't lose it or accidentally delete it. It's stuck in there forever. Um, beyond capability statements, how does an agency learn the details and nuances of specific services? Uh, where do the demonstrations, education, and Q&A take place? Um, great question. So this would be associated to industry days. So I touched on that a little bit in the slides. Uh, industry days are big because they allow you to, um, you know, ask questions, bring some demonstration uh, and, and certification description and things of that nature and, and you know, really communicate with the customers. Um, other than that, there's really uh, not a whole lot of, of opportunity to do demo. Um, so if you could embed links to demonstration videos you have um, or anything of that sort uh, that a co contracting officer can click on, uh, that would be huge. And that'd probably be the best way to, to you know, get them to visualize what you're talking about in your um, capability statements. I hope that answered that question. Um, if one of a few responses are very qualified for the work, would they think about bringing them into the competition, even though it probably wouldn't be on that initially advertised vehicle? If one of a few responses are very qualified for the work. Um, 
So I, Lachlan, I, I want to, um, I, I don't really understand your question exactly how it's written or, or in a circumstance. So um, I'm going to have to skip that one. Shoot me an email. Um, sh actually, I could probably put my email in the chat uh, in case you guys want to email me. And I'll, I'll get that answer for you as soon as I can. Um, okay. Why are GSA RFQs not always publicly available? We follow eBuy, but often learn. Okay. So here's a great uh, circumstance. RFQs only get seen by the category in which they're posted. So if you don't have uh, Oasis pool one, on your contract, then, and it's posted in Oasis pool one, you will never be able to see it. You won't even be able to open it in eBuy. It's limited to only the vendors who we've already determined may have the capability to perform the work based on the NAICS code identified by the contracting office. So um, that's why it's super important to have all of your capabilities reflected in the sins that that are applicable to you um, have it on your contract or and or pools. Uh, I don't know if if you can add pools now um, or not as a mod. That that would be a, a Jonathan question um, for later, I guess. Okay, cool. Um, Perfect. Is it okay to ask for a debrief after solicitation closes? Uh, great question, Krishna. Um, I think I touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, FAR Part 8.4 does not require, um, uh, actually, I'm sorry, I think it's under fifth, under 16. Uh, anyway, the I, I can find the reference for you at GSA Awards do not require a debrief at all if the basis for award was LPTA. If it was anything other than LPTA, say they wanted um, past performance, past applicable performance to the agency, then their only response required is we considered past performance to the agency as 40% of selection criteria. And that's all they have to tell you. They don't have to give any, any further debrief or anything like that. So uh, it, that's one of the reasons why contracting officers enjoyed using GSA schedules is because they don't have to explain themselves um, very detailed. Um, all right. If you have multiple opportunities coming out of the office at 45th cons for multiple end customers. Is it reasonable to request a meeting to discuss those opportunities with both the contracting specialist or the contracting officer? Yeah, always ask um, if, if a contracting office POC is um, willing to do a meeting. Um, I will tell you this, I, uh, from my perspective, I'm only allowed to relay information that was given to me by the contracting officer. So uh, as public information. So um, a lot of times people say, hey, Sean, can I talk to you about these uh, requirements that I replied to in GSA eBuy? If it's currently an open um, opportunity, I can't tell you anything outside of what you can read or the information you can get from the contracting officer because I work for them also. Um, so I, I'm kind of limited when things are in um, in competition phase at that time. But I definitely recommend uh, setting up a meeting with the specialist or the officer. Um, typically, their boss will have oversight of multiple things. And, and if you're a vendor who is uh, capable for many of their pieces of work, uh, sometimes you can recommend they bundle them together if they're of similar requirement and minimize their contract acquisition lead time um, and their their overall administrative actions. All right. Anonymous attendee, 
GSA open is only open to federal contractors. Um, okay, so um, the content is only available to federal employees who authenticate OMB Max. Yep, so somebody let us know uh, eBuy or GSA eBuy open is only open to federal contractors. Um, next question, how many contact people should we have in our organization to receive GSA postings? Bonnie, this is a great question. Um, so if you guys open your GSA eBuy um, account information, you likely will have different people for different categories as the point of contact that gets emailed. What I would recommend is setting up a email box for your organization, uh, similarly to the Oasis emails that I see people set up. Um, set up an email box for your organization and set that to receive all of the category um, solicitation notices and then uh, give people who are applicable access to that email box. There's nothing worse than us posting something to say 541-330-ENG and then I go in and I copy and paste uh, 983 emails and 600 of them get kicked back because the email address is no longer valid. Um, that, that really, it, it destroys me because that means there's 600 people who aren't getting the notice that something's been posted. Um, so make sure you're, you're updating your contact information per your categories. And I highly recommend a single inbox that you give people access to or create a mail forwarding through your um, server on the back end. Um, all right. Following an RFI, is the pool notified if the pool was selected or not? Um, that's a great question. No. Uh, no. <laughs> there, there, really, there's no long answer to it. Uh, they don't have to let you guys know that they went a different direction. Uh, it's market research only. So uh, you can always email the contracting officer and say like, hey, did this ever go pool one or pool five B or whatever? And they'll likely get back to you and say, hey, no, we went a different direction or or whatever the case may be. Um, all right. Can a decision to begin a sole source procurement to an 8A firm be made based on RFI or source of sought responses? Yes. And uh, many times that, that's exactly why the RFI is posted to 8A um, firms uh, it, or, or a category that has 8A firms within it is so that the contracting officer can say, ooh, let's go ahead and set this aside to 8A and do a sole source uh, award. So yes. Um, will GSA consider giving more full access to contractors um, in the acquisition gateway? Uh, Jacqueline, I wish I had an answer for you. I don't manage those permissions. I'm significantly lower on the totem pole for the, uh, the capability of making that decision. So I, I apologize. Um, that might be something you can submit to a uh, help ticket on the acquisition gateway to ask the question. Uh, can you repeat what you're saying about having the capabilities on your website? Um, yeah, so on your, let me open this up here real quick. So on your website, uh, I'll share my screen. All right, uh, actually I should probably play from beginning. Okay, so um, oh, I should have clicked current slide. All right, so on your website, you should have uh, a logo that as an image is a hyperlink to your catalog, right? Um, and then you should probably also have your capability statement summary uh, somewhere in the vicinity 
of your GSA contract holder logo so that a contracting officer, if they click on your name, they, um, here's where I'm talking about these, these logos. So you can, you can add these logos uh, and create that image as a button uh, for a hyperlink. And then that way you'll be able, they'll, they'll be able to get directly to your, um, your uh, contract. And then of course your capability statement somewhere near this GSA, or you say capability statement, click here and you click it and it takes them to a PDF, a one or two page PDF that really breaks down your capabilities and summary so that they don't have to search all around your website looking for things. So um, definitely go to gsa.gov forward slash logo and get a logo on your website for sure. Um, uh, can you talk about running a report from beta SAM or old FPDS? Um, no, I don't. Um, as, as a matter of fact, I've only been in beta SAM like five times. Um, like besides when I click on an open market opportunity to determine if it's something GSA could do. And then I call the contracting officer, but I, I have, very little experience in beta SAM. Uh, um, that, that's probably another course or maybe a subject matter expert um, that the team could get uh, to help you on that one. So I think that's the last question and I'm 18 minutes over. I hope um, I hope I answered questions for everybody. Um, if you have any further information, uh, please, please shoot me an email. I put it in uh, the chat. It's at the 2.07 p.m. mark. So you can just scroll to that within the chat for all panelists. Um, and my email is there. You can send me an email anytime. Uh, I'm also on LinkedIn and you can connect with me there as well. So I'll pass it back over to Arlinda. And uh, I hope today was beneficial for you guys as GSA vendors. And I, I look forward to helping you win more work in the future. Wow. Thank you, Sean. That was just great. I'm um, getting feedback from participants about um, the quantity and quality of information, the pace. It was all just great. So thank you so much. I'm sure that everyone who was um, online today actually got a lot, a lot from this presentation. And remember, it was taped, um, it was recorded so that everyone who uh, was online today will have access to the presentation. So we thank you very much for joining us today. We want to remind you that we have another uh, educational industry education webinar next month. Next month, it will be on sh surety bonds uh, for small businesses as a way to help you access a government contract. So thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you next month. And thanks again, Sean, so much. Absolutely. Actually, it looks like some people didn't see my email. So it's Sean, S-H-A-U-N dot Hartman, H-A-R-T-M-A-N at G-S-A dot gov. And uh, I look forward to helping you guys in the future. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Everyone stay safe out there. <laughs>